Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Capital District Transportation Committee's New Visions Virtual Learning Series. It's 3.30, so we are going to get started. Today's webinar is on infrastructure planning and management, building a 21st century transportation network. Um, uh, my name is Jennifer Sponis, and I am the Director of Regional Planning here at CDTC. Um, and just as a reminder, this is a webinar, so if you are attending, your mic is muted, you can see us and we cannot see you. Please um, keep your questions till the end, use the chat or the Q&A function um, at the end. If you would prefer to say your question, raise your hand, um, request to be unmuted, and we will unmute you. If you are an AICP planner, today's webinar just qualified for CM credits. Or if you are a planning or a zoning board member and your municipality has approved CDTC's webinars, you can also get credit um, for your training requirements for New York State Department of State training. Today, we have two great panelists. We have Melissa Foley, who is the program manager at the New York State LTAP Center for No Local Roads Program. And we also have Chuck Hickson, business development manager um, North America for Digital Construction Works. Today's agenda, um, we'll start with a brief overview of CDTC's Long Range Plan, New Visions 2050. And then I will pass it to Melissa, who will talk about um, asset management and capital planning tools and resources available through the Cornell Local Roads Program. And then Chuck will talk about technology impacts and trends for capital planning. And then we'll end the, today's webinar um, the re reviewing available data and infrastructure planning assistance here at CDTC um, and close for questions and discussion. So New Visions 2050 is CDTC's, long, CDTC's long range plan. It's the blueprint for the Capital Region Transportation Network. It is a federally required document and it influences how we do, how we decide um, all of our planning program initiatives that we decide to um, invest in, as well as the capital program, the TIP, the Transportation Improvement Program. Um, it was developed collaboratively, uh, not only with our local governments and state agencies, but also with the public and other transportation providers here in the capital region. And New Visions paves the way for maintaining and modernizing, modernizing the transportation system. Many of the big investments that have been made in the regional transportation network um, were, were able to happen because of the principles in the New Visions 2050 plan and because these projects have been identified as strategic um, projects that are worthy of the region's investment. Um, of the federal funds that we receive. So a snapshot of the capital region shows that we are a unique multinodal area. Some have referred to us as a, a constellation of cities. We're not a typical metro area with a central city and surrounding suburbs. We have eight cities and a number of unique towns and villages that are connected by a series of highways and arterials and we share a common economy. The region is situated at the crossroads of two major interstates, I-90 and I-87, two rivers, the Mohawk and the Hudson, and two trail systems, the Champlain Canal and the Erie Canalway Trail, which are together um, referred to now as the Empire State Trail System. There are a range of communities from urban to suburban to rural that attract visitors and residents um, due to the number of social, cultural, economic, and recreational opportunities that they've created, and it's the home of a state capital and enjoys a stable economy 
that's also bolstered by the large state government workforce, a number of colleges and universities, um, large medical institutions, and other large employers. Despite these advantages and consistent development, the region has experienced little growth. Um, the population is not projected to increase significantly. However, um, with this development, and little growth, we have seen an increase in driving, we've seen changing needs throughout the region, an aging population, smaller families, less younger drivers, and all of us rely on a network of roads, bridges, sidewalks, and more that's valued at over $30 billion, and we must maintain and continue to adapt and modernize the system. So while we are maintaining the existing network, we are also planning for changes ahead. There are many changes we expect, and then there are the things that we don't. So the impacts of the COVID pandemic on the transportation system from March 2020 through today were not anticipated. How um, do we maintain and modernize the system based on anticipated changes and trends while ensuring it is resilient and flexible and adaptable to other possible changes and disruptions? We continue here at CDTC to monitor traffic and infrastructure conditions and assist communities with community and infrastructure planning, but there are other resources and expertise available that communities can take advantage of. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Melissa Foley from the New York State LTAP Cornell Local Roads Program to discuss available planning tools and resources there. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. I'm Melissa Foley with New York State LTAP Cornell Local Roads Mo Program. And um, that is a mouthful, right? So let me break it down for you. LTAP is a local tribal technical assistance program. There are 52 centers. There's one in every state of the nation, and there's one in Puerto Rico and one at the Native American areas. We're funded by the federal government, FHWA, and in New York State, we have a match from the New York State DOT, Department of Transportation, and also from Cornell University. We're housed at Cornell, but our mandate, as with all LTAPs, is to serve the entire state, and we serve the people who work on the local roads. So not the interstates, not the large roads, but the local roads. And in New York State, there are over 1,500 different town highway superintendents, DPW directors, people of that mode who work on the local roads. And so that's who our audience is. What we're trying to do is send them the latest, greatest uh, information on how to best plow the roads using less salt. Uh, what's warm mix? What's cold mix? What's the best way to pave your roads in any weather? All that kind of information we're extending from Cornell University and also through the LTAPs. So this is how we do it. We have different workshops. We do about 50 a year. Uh, webinars aimed at the engineering audience. Two major conferences, the Highway School, and that's what you see pictured here. It's a demo at Highway School. Uh, attracts about 750 uh, highway superintendents to Ithaca College in June every year. We also do bridge conference, which is a little bit more aimed at counties and uh, engineers and DOT staff who manage the bridges. That's in the fall. And there are about 350 people who attend that every year. We have direct technical assistance with our engineers. We've got a really fun lab in the basement of our building here at Cornell. And we do research on uh, thaw and freeze mechanisms and all kinds of fun stuff like that. And I'm going to talk about our Cornell Asset Management Program, or CAMP for short, is when we get there. And finally, of course, we have newsletters and a really active website. So back to those 50 workshops that we do every year. This is what we did in spring, and you can see that the counties that have colors in them are the counties that we hit. And so again, our mandate is to serve the entire state and we try to get to every county every year with a workshop. These are the different workshops that we do. 
Some of them are management oriented, so running your highway department, communication. Some of them are more legal oriented, uh, reducing your legal liability, powers and duties of local highway officials. And some are much more nuts and bolts, uh, snow and ice control. And a really popular one is work zone traffic control for local roads. You know, uh, some of these municipalities, especially, especially the smaller ones, may not even have more than two people on their crew. It's very small. And so they're not going to be able to do the ideal flagging coning situation on the local roads. But we work with them to come up with the safest methods for what they have. Uh, we also do engineering workshops. We do about two to six of those a year, usually in the summer, and they are for PDH credits. Our director, David Orr, came up with foundational webinars that we started last year, and they're really interesting. They are aimed at, if you are a new engineer in the transportation industry, what are the basics that you need to know that maybe you didn't learn in school, maybe you didn't learn in your technical training, and this really addresses the why of everything. So for culverts, for instance, why are we putting in that specific culvert? Why are we putting it under this area instead of that area? You know, with work zones, why do we set up the work zone the way we do? So this is a list of all the webinars that are coming up in the next few months. These webinars are free of charge uh, unless you want a PDH. And so there are some PDHs available, the ones with the stars. Most of our workshops are really priced fairly because we're not trying, we're nonprofit, right? We're extension. Uh, so these basic workshops are $50 for a day and that includes lunch. The engineering ones can be a little bit more expensive than that. And the webinars are free. In addition, we do technical assistance. So what that means is we have two engineers on staff and they are here to answer the questions of the local highway community. So if someone had a question, for instance, about a guide rail situation that they didn't feel was quite right or they couldn't update it or didn't know where to install it, they could just give us a call, email us, and um, again, free of charge, we'll give them advice. We might even do a site visit and see what's going on. Uh, the only thing the engineers don't do is uh, schematics. They don't do drawings because they're not in competition with, with the actual consultants who are there to do that, but we will point you in the right direction. We partner with several agencies throughout the state, again, to stretch everyone's budget a little further and to collaborate with them on conferences and workshops and social media. And finally, here we are at camp. So this is the Cornell Asset Management Program, and it's limited every year to 15 municipalities. And the way it works is the municipality applies to join the program. And these kids you see in the background of the slide are actually interns, they're college students. And we match an intern with a municipality and the intern goes out to that city or town or village and spends the whole summer going around and inventorying their roads and streets and figuring out what kind of condition they're in. And also we've just added culverts to that. And so, the beauty of this is at the end of the summer, you've got an asset management plan that that highway superintendent or DPW director can take to their elected officials. It's neutral, it's non-biased, and it can save them a lot of money to know which roads to put money into first. And that can be a really charged situation in some municipalities, so there's value in just having this sort of um, like I said, non-biased opinion and view. So before we get too far into that, I'm going to actually show you a video, that, a video that a couple of interns in Otsego County put together. Contractors Jacqueline Quarter and Parker Fish of Milford, along with the help of Otsego County Planner Eric Scrivener, are spending the duration of the summer working on the Highway Assets Management Program. The Highway Assets Management Program, or HAMP, 
is a Cornell University local roads focus program used to grade and determine the overall quality of pavement. In the case of Otsego County, Jacqueline and Parker traveled the over 900 lane miles of county highways, grading each based on a predetermined survey sheet. The sheet includes categories such as rutting, potholes, edge cracking, and several other pavement defects. Funds for this project are allocated from the Otsego County Planning Department budget. However, the work will save the county millions in future repair costs. Roads are graded based on a scale of 1 to 94, 94 being a perfect newly paved road with little to no defects. The worst road in the county scored an 8, while only one small section of road in southern Oneonta received a perfect 94. The program's goal is to create a five-year plan to increase the score of each road to 70 or above, that being Cornell's average of a road that will only need to undergo preventative work for several years to follow. This five-year plan will include the collected grading data, the budget numbers resulting from previous repairs, and the timeline of work to be completed. The final report is to be presented at the upcoming September board meeting. This is County Route 14. Here on County Route 14, we have a perfect example of drainage issues. As you can see here, these cracks in the road are called alligator cracking. Looks like the skin of an alligator. These are caused by poor drainage and other defects. Eventually, when sections of this alligator cracking comes out, it causes potholes, as we see here. Poor drainage also leads to what we can see here is edge cracking. It starts off like this, and then sections of the road come out. It also causes these cuts along the roadway along the edge. Lastly, you can see poor drainage also causes in the pavement looks like this. As you can see up here, those are called keys. Those are caused when water gets under the roadway during the cold or winter months and causes the road and the pavement to actually go like this. Example is almost five inches deep. According to the Cornell Local Roads Program, a perfect score is a 94. County Highway 47. Uh, received a score of 94. It's the only county highway that's been perfectly scored. Most of our scores are, are well below that. But as you can see, there's no alligator cracking, edge cracking, or longitudinal cracking. Uh, the major indicators of water issues on the road. Uh, as you can see here, water's getting off the road, which is keeping the road good. After driving the over 900 lane miles in Otsego County, we found that almost all of our roads failed, falling below 70. There's extensive alligator and longitudinal cracking on most of our county highways. This is caused by drainage issues, which is also the first step in resolving this problem. After collecting all of this data, we created a five-year capital improvement plan, which we intend to reevaluate annually. And that's all there is. All right, so that is a really cute nutshell uh, of what camp is all about. If you know of a municipality that's interested in joining us in camp this year, you can contact Jeffrey Scott. He's our technical assistance engineer who runs the program. And also, if you want to see the rest of the video, it's on our website, which is right down here. Um, and that's our whole program in a very, in a very small, short package. Uh, you're welcome to reach out to me if you want to find out more about what we do. And uh, I guess with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chuck. Thank you, Melissa. I will share my screen. And uh, hopefully you're seeing my presentation. Looks good. Uh, Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, in the last presentation, there was talk about asset management and tracking the condition of roadways. And uh, I certainly see that on the technology side. And what I'm gonna talk about today is how uh, all the work that's done in planning, design, and construction is now being leveraged for asset management as well. Um, so with that, I will forge on. Uh, just real quickly with my bio, I do uh, co-chair the Transportation Research Board's BIM for Infrastructure uh, Subcommittee, which is a group of uh, state agencies, uh, universities, uh, vendors, and consultants that are all trying to find innovative ways uh, to uh, in technology to improve traffic. Um, so. What I'd like to do is kind of talk about the trends that are happening out there. And I'm certain you've been exposed to some of these. Um, 
In the design and construction phase uh, of any project, there's a myriad of tools that are now being used. And the challenge is how do we get all these tools to work together? And as you can see, some of those tools aren't uh, necessarily tools for the design and construction. They also blend into the asset management where you're having sensors, for example, monitoring uh, a bridge. So how do we leverage all of the information that's being produced in the planning, design, and construction phase um, into asset management? And then just as important, tie all that together. Um, some of the workflows that are out there today, um, everyone's I'm certain heard of 3D design where we're designing roads in the third dimension. Um, many agencies today are, are uh, migrating to 4D and 5D workflows where they're attaching a schedule to that 3D model so that you can actually see the construction phasing. 5D is where we'll attach a cost to that as well. So you can not only see the phasing, but you can compute how much cost there is at a specific point and then use that as a benchmark for the actual construction. Um, the 6D and 7D, which you maybe haven't heard of, that's where we're talking about the handoff from design and construction into the asset and uh, maintenance of a facility. And uh, the term digital twin is the word of the day. And that is where we're taking all the information, all the data produced, and we're actually using it now to manage those assets. So that, for example, you saw in the video with the, the grading of a roadway, well, now we can tie that information back into the actual uh, design and construction files. So as we move forward with a future project, that data can actually be applied to it and used for the estimating and bidding process uh, of a future project. Um, some of the other technology trends, as I mentioned, is just a myriad of applications that are embedded inside each one of the phases of a project. And um, today, um, a project's not singularly thought of as just a planning project anymore. It's, it's a life cycle um, all the way through into the asset and maintenance of that uh, project. So again, how do we get all these tools to work together? And then also how do we um, exploit and use all that information uh, to help us manage uh, the assets we have out there? So uh, certainly a big challenge. Uh, other trends that uh, really come forth is the fact that there's so much data now out there and uh, you are exposed to massive amounts of data on a daily basis. How do we manage it? Where do we get it from? And, and how do we use that data? Um, and this slide clearly shows you that it's a data-driven world out there. And uh, these numbers will only increase as time goes on. So with all these technology trends, it, the, you know, do we stay the same? Do we change? And uh, the answer is we need to change. The business practices of the world have changed. How we do business is different. Uh, for example, Uber is the largest transportation company in the world, yet they don't own any vehicles. It's just a different way uh, of thinking and practicing and leveraging technology. Um, the biggest one that impacts planners today is there is a concerted effort to integrate the primary planning tools such as GIS and have that integrate into the actual uh, 3D, 4D, 5D modeling programs that are out there today. So all that good information, again, is used and leveraged into the next phase and beyond. So the future and where everything's heading is a common data environment or CDE. And that's where my firm digital construction work sits, which is in all aspects. The image on the left is the life cycle of a project. And 
there's a myriad of data that's produced in each one of those slices of that pie and how it gets used and leveraged is where we sit. We try to connect those gaps and allow people in the field to be able to see the data that's produced in the office uh, so that that person that was out inspecting that roadway should be able to bring a tablet out there and be able to access previous grading to see if that road is actually worse than it was before or, or even the fact that it might be some CAD data that they can reference as well uh, for tracking potholes, et cetera. So the lessons learned uh, moving forward is there's a lot of hurdles to be crossed, but cross them, uh, the industry shall. And, and how do we migrate with uh, most agencies have very constrained budgets. So how do you be innovative uh, with limited budgets? Um, also, all this integration uh, is a, a significant effort to uh, set up and run. It's no longer just installing software anymore. There's a whole bunch of behind the scenes things that need to happen to integrate all that data that uh, is needed. <clears throat> With that, of course, training um, is also um, a necessity. And uh, what we're seeing out there too is there's a limited amount of, of folks to support that. So the technology is great, but we got a ways to go to implement it holistically, uh, but it is happening out there in the industry. Um, so as we move forward, we need to think differently too, and meaning things that we worked well in the past won't necessarily work well in the future. Uh, for example, most construction inspectors go out in the field with uh, 11 by 17 plan set to reference what has been designed. Um, in the future, in the near future, uh, that'll all be done on a tablet uh, so that not only do you have access to the plan set, but you have access to the data behind that plan set. Um, again, got to stop thinking kind of analog. And so why use PDS when you actually can have access to the entire model? Um, all the lessons learned is uh, agencies have uh, limited staff and uh, most of the large transportation agencies that I've been speaking to are losing staff uh, rapidly, uh, predominantly through retirement. Uh, I was speaking to a lead engineer from South Carolina DOT and they're going to lose over a thousand engineers in the next year. And that's a major factor in how to move forward. But also a major reason why we need to integrate and work more effectively uh, because we won't have as many people as we did in the past. So the keys to success to implement a digital twin world is it starts with top-down leadership and uh, for example, Pennsylvania, uh, PennDOT is one of the leading agencies in the country that's trying to implement a digital delivery workflow. And uh, much of that success is attributed to senior leadership pushing for it. And there are several lead agencies in the country that have that type of dynamic with Texas, Iowa, and California being some of the others. Um, other keys is you need a well-executed plan before you go out and, and try to do anything. You, you need to think through what it is you're trying to achieve, because now it's not just a specific um, phase of a project. You have to think holistically for the entire project. Um, and that can be achieved by um, getting the entire organization uh, active at the beginning of that process and getting input from everyone. For example, one of the problems I've seen is that when a large project or any project started, um, the asset management folks are not included in that discussion. And uh, some of the results of that is that a very fancy 3D model with all sorts of data can be created, but the content is of no value to that uh, planner, or excuse me, asset management person. Uh, so it's not used and leveraged in the future. So lots of active, and I always tell anybody, 
don't overwhelm yourself. Start on a very small project first and integrate the technology um, as you go. Uh, so uh, as we get toward a minor presentation, uh, despite all the challenges that I meant, uh, BIM for infrastructure or digital twins is here to stay. It, it's definitely a uh, up and coming technology that will supplant and replace CAD. And I'm certain we'll replace GIS workflows as well. Uh, again, as all this information uh, will be put into a Google Earth like application where you'll have uh, visual uh, graphics to help you learn and understand things, but a uh, tremendous amount of data behind all that imagery as well. Um, and the final key takeaways is that there is a lot of digital transformation happening out there today. And um, you can uh, implement a program, whether you're a large agency or small, uh, you just need to have an effective strategy. And again, top-down leadership to make that happen. Um, and one of the other key takeaways that we've seen out there is that um, agencies that typically excel at all this design technology have champions that really advocate and push forward uh, to see it to its successful conclusion. Um, collaboration is humongous, again, as we are now no longer just focused on planning or no longer just focused on design. We are focused on the entire project. So we need to think of all aspects before we go ahead and start. And uh, again, what we have seen is the results of all this far have exceeded expectations. Uh, the New York State uh, Department of Transportation has implemented uh, a BIM or digital delivery program on some very large projects in New York City. And they have a um, return on investment study that will be published hopefully at the end of this month that will detail 11 unique parameters that they studied uh, to see how this technology would work. And I think um, that would be a compelling document for any transportation agency uh, to review. Um, and again, hopefully that'll be out and published at the end of this month. So uh, thank you for your time and I will pass it back over to Jen. Thanks, Chuck. Um, that is, I, we are very interested in BIM, kind of something newer that we are trying to learn more about. Um, you know, we, we have... Um, use LIDAR and drones and some other new technologies for data collection, but bringing that all together and using it um, in the ways you talked about, that's kind of our next step and challenge, so. Yeah, there's lots of tremendous content out there that's very good. It's just how do you use it for whatever aspect of your project um, is needed. And that's the quest of DCW and many other firms, how to, how can you see that LIDAR content for whatever you're trying to do? Um, so a lot of that will uh, be refined over the next several years. Great. Um, okay, so hopefully you can see um, my slides again. Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so I am just going to briefly talk about um, how CDTC, uh, collects and maintains data and what data CDTC collects and maintains and can provide to local communities here in the capital region. Um, most of what we do, other MPOs also do, um, but CDTC does collect um, road pavement condition data. Uh, we used to do all of the non-state federal aid system in the region and a local sample. We no longer do that because um, New York State DOT has some of that data. So we are sharing data with DOT, but we do have contracts with um, some of our municipalities. We do a windshield survey. Um, it's not quite as detailed 
as the, the survey and condition um, assessment that Melissa talked about um, through the CAMP program. Um, but we collect data for Albany County, the city of Albany and city of Schenectady on a, um, the Albany County on an annual basis and our cities we collect biannually. CDTC also collects infrastructure data for multi-use trails, those are paved trails, um, bike facilities, everything from bike lanes, cycle tracks, bike boxes, sharrows. We have um, all of that data available in a GIS. All of this is available in GIS. We also have sidewalks and crosswalks. Mobility traffic and safety data is also being collected, um, monitored, and uh, maintained. So we have a contract and we do on-demand traffic counts um, for traffic volume, turning movements, bike ped counts. Um, we also have uh, equipment. We have automated uh, counting uh, pieces of technology from EcoCounter that we deploy on paved trails to do trail user counts. We also have access to big data sets like Replica um, and Strava Metro. Strava Metro is, we use it for bicycling data and it's, it is more recreational bicycling, um, but it has been useful in doing uh, some of our planning initiatives. And then of course, we work very closely with our um, State Department of Transportation and Regional Transportation Providers, DOT has a traffic viewer, bridge conditions, and then of course the clear crash data viewer where we um, can pull safety data and do safety analyses. CDPHP cycle is our bike share system and we have data on, we can make heat maps on where the bikes are being um, ridden, hubs that are more popular, where uh, destinations and, and um, origins of those bike share bikes, also transit ridership and the CBTA Flex, which is an on-demand um, micro transit program. So infrastructure data that we collect and maintain helps determine future needs and can be used for short-term capital planning. The chart on the left shows that there has been an increase in the percent of good pavement and a decrease in percent poor pavement in the region since 2009. So this might illustrate the impact of preservation first policies or increased investment in pavement preservation and other policy and investment changes or shifts. Tracking pavement condition over time helps us evaluate progress in achieving our long range goals and can help us project what our needs may be in five, 10 or 15 years. So as preservation treatments can extend the usable life of these assets, um, over time they become less effective and ultimately each must be replaced, but when? So we must continue to collect this data to determine the best strategy for future pavement and bridge treatments and determine the best investment strategies for the future. When CDDC collects this data, we share the data um, with municipalities and um, for the, to assist them with developing pavement and other capital plans. So the image on the right is a map that we created for the city of Albany based on their pavement conditions in 2019. Um, that's just one you know, uh, uh, resource piece of data that we provide to them to assist with their paving program. These are some other examples of how data is being put to use in the capital region. Um, Trail counts and user surveys were used to help develop the regional trails plan and estimate the impact of adding 200 miles of new trails. Uh, this is an example of a study where we, we use automated counting technologies and we also use drone technology to collect data on where existing trails were and then where um, some potential corridors um, could be created to connect the network. Using CDTC sidewalk inventory as a foundation, CDTC is working with communities to develop ADA transition plans. So um, with this, we identify physical obstacles and conditions of sidewalks, curb ramps, crosswalks, and transit stops to determine what infrastructure is accessible and what infrastructure 
must be modified or modernized to become uh, accessible to all pedestrians. Last year, CDTC worked with a consultant to review 377 locally owned bridges and identify candidates that could benefit from preservation strategies. Then we worked collaboratively, collaboratively with the bridge owners um, to develop a potential schedule. At the project level, CDTC uses infrastructure data to support, inform, and enhance site-specific studies like corridor studies, linkage studies, municipal level studies, and regional studies. Um, in the village of Castleton on Hudson, here in the capital region, uh, CDTC worked with the village to prepare for their comprehensive plan updates. We collected data compiled and analyzed transportation-related data along key corridors to help inform that comprehensive plan process. And then at the programming level, CDTC uses infrastructure data to support and enhance TIP project selection through our TIP merit evaluation process, as well as in the development of new visions, our long-range plan. So there are currently funding opportunities at CDTC available to um, cities, towns, villages, and our MPO members here. Currently, the CDTC and CDRPC Technical Assistance Program is accepting um, applications and new proposals. This program offers CDTC and CDRPC our our friends down the hall at the Regional Planning Commission staff time and expertise to undertake small scale community planning initiatives. These can be things as, you know, as small as collecting and analyzing data to prepare and inform a plan comprehensive um, plan update or zoning update. It could also be a um, trail connection plan or identifying a route for a uh, sidewalk or trail project. We do ask that any community that's interested in the program to reach out and contact us to request more information and to discuss a scope and reasonable budget. And then, of course, um, the 2023-2024 Unified Planning Work Program or UPWP solicitation is currently open. This is our one-year planning budget here at CDTC. We have up to $1 million in federal planning funds available. Uh, completed applications are due by Wednesday, November 30th. And there are program guidelines and application guidance on our website. More resources are available um, as far as data and information also on our website and on our partners' websites. The CDTC Maps and Data webpage um, has a lot of information, much of what we talked about today. There's also the NISOT Pavement Management Unit and NISOT's data and mapping applications. And then I provided the link to um, Melissa's organization, the New York State LTAP Cornell Local Roads Program. CDTC recently uh, released the Smart Mobility Toolbox. This toolbox is um, a collection of what we're calling smart city strategies that are that can be um, integrated into the transportation system to improve accessibility, efficiency, um, to improve overall quality and experience of using the transportation system but also to save uh, money in operations, maintenance and management of infrastructure on a uh, facility owner, municipalities end of things. So the full toolbox can be found on the CDTC webpage and there um, is also a project website that is a companion to that, that kind of goes through the different types of technologies. The, BIM building um, information modeling that Chuck talked about is included as one of our strategies that we are uh, exploring and looking at ways to integrate that and help our community start using. This new visions virtual learning series is part of a, a monthly ongoing webinar series 
our next webinar is December 13th, and it is on uh, planning for freight efficient land uses. Um, and you can also find more information about that webinar and how to register on our website. All of the New Visions webinars are recorded and uploaded to CDBC's New Visions webpage, as well as the CDTC YouTube channel. You can also find a copy of the Long Range Transportation Plan New Visions 2020 on our website. And with that, um, if anyone has any questions, um, if they want to use the chat or the Q&A, we will open it up and the panelists will be available to um, discuss anything further or answer any questions. So I don't see anything in the chat or in the Q and A, um, but Chuck, I'm wondering if if you have more information on that NISDOT report on the return on investment of BIM. Um, maybe we can provide a link or just some information about that on our New Visions website to so that people can follow up on that. Yeah, I very much want, I wish I could give you the link. It, it's been sitting on a chief engineer's desk for almost three months now, waiting for him to bless it. And I'm not sure where he's going to publish it, so I, I don't know. Um, the project is the Q Gardens Interchange. It's K-E-W. Um, it was phase three um, that they this study's based on, and um, the New York State DOT received an aid grant from the FHWA to help foster the use of BIM workflows into this project, and part of that uh, grant requires uh, a published results, and that's what this is, and uh, I've seen some results, and I'm, I can't disclose them, but they're surprisingly good um, but the report also includes the challenges what kind of didn't work and how to improve um, for the next project and I guess that's my final point is all of this digital cities or BIM for infrastructure whatever you want to call it is going to be a living breathing document that will continually be modified um, as you refine your workflows. So I will certainly, once I get it, I will forward that link to um, the, the CDTC uh, Great. when yeah. it comes out. That's definitely something you want to follow. Um, and then I, I have a question for Melissa. If, there, if we know of um, students that might be interested in working for the CAMP program, mm -hmm. how, when do they have to apply to that? Yeah, it's a good question. I think uh, if they got to us by March, that would be really helpful. But I think they actually, we'd have to ask Jeff Scott, the engineer, I think they have a bit longer than the municipalities. We get the municipalities in first. And then uh, sometimes the municipalities even find their own student because the student needs to either live or be right. willing to move right to that town or city for the summer. Mm -hmm. Great. I know we've worked with communities that have used the um, your program to collect data, and then we've worked with them on local planning initiatives. So, oh, great, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so I don't see any questions, um, but I do want to thank Chuck and Melissa for being available today and for these great presentations and. We will um, upload the recording of today's webinar to the CDC YouTube and post it to the web page. And if anyone um, 
has any questions or would like to find us, you can email us, call us, um, or find us on social media. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. That was fun. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great night. Okay. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Melissa. Mm -hmm.